Let's briefly discuss the concept of dynamic programming because it is one of the algorithms that takes the most time to get used to. It is an example of an exhaustive search, which means that we evaluate all of the different possibilities and then we pick the best one or best ones that exist globally. In this particular example, we have uh, two sequences, which is uh, two strands of DNA that we hypothesize, hypothesize belong to the same region in two organisms or perhaps two species. Here we have our sequence one, which we programmers usually start counting at, at zero. So we're going to call it sequence zero. And here we have the sequence one. So these two sequences can be aligned. That's the general idea behind uh, preparing data for, for DNA analysis. So the question is, what is the best form of aligning these two sequences so that we maximize the number of letters that are matched with each other while minimizing the number of gaps or hypotheses of missing data in the structure of the, in the, structure of the sequence? So let's take a look at the diagram here on the right. So each of these sequences can be represented as a series of elements inside of a two-dimensional matrix, where one of the sequences goes to the rows and the other one goes into the different columns. Here, if you pay attention in the very first column, you're going to see the comparison of the position of the letter A, which is one of the nucleotides or elements in this sequence, compared against every single one of the other elements of the other sequence, all of the other nucleotides. So the only thing that we need now is to have a criterion that allows us to evaluate which comparisons or matches are better than others. That's where dynamic programming comes in. So the concept is relatively simple. So we start with a matrix of zeros that represents the comparison of every single letter of one sequence against the other. And here we start at the very top left corner. So the general idea is that every time that we move from one position, this can represent, this uh, represents the score. Every time that we move from this position to a next one in the horizontal plane, which would be moving across columns, we can insert gaps. That would mean that we can't leave spaces between one nucleotide to the next one, for example here, in order to move every single nucleotide that follows one position to the right. So let's take a look at one simple example. Here we start at the top left corner. The score is zero and we move to the right, which would be the second column. If you look at the sequence zero, that would mean that we want to keep the value T in this nucleotide of sequence one with match to the position T. So we would have a T from sequence zero compared with a T from sequence, sequence one. And in this particular case, we just need a score. So how good is this guess? Of course, there is a lot of dependency on the parameters of your system. If you want uh, the, if you want to maximize the letters that are the same, then you're gonna give penalties that are close or equal to zero. The general idea of this algorithm is that as you traverse this two-dimensional matrix, you're gonna be subtracting values to the score. Then we're gonna then we're gonna traverse the two-dimensional matrix and we're gonna invert the process following the path of less resistance. So let's keep moving forward. Let's assume that we move to the right. So what does that mean for our sequences? If you look in here, you can see that the sequence one now has added to it a gap. This gap is penalized, which means that this position right here, moving from the score zero to the right, adding one gap in this position is going to give us a score of negative two because that is the parameter that maps to the presence of gaps. We repeat the experiment and this time we want to make sure that the nucleotide G of the sequence zero matches the very first T of the sequence one. What that means for us is that we're going to insert a second gap in the sequence one and you can see that this T and this G now overlap with each other. We take the value of the previous score, which is the assumption that one gap was already inserted, and then we subtract the value of another gap, and it gives us minus four. We repeat the process. 
and by adding a third gap, we reach the score minus 6, and then minus 8. Now that we are done with one row, it's time to work in the next row. However, this time we move down. If moving to the right leaves gaps in the sequence 1, then moving vertically, or down, should add gaps in the sequence 0. That's what we observe. And the general pattern remains. The value of inserting a gap is still minus 2, so we give that value. But wait a minute, because now we have a different pattern here. For the first time, it's not just a matter of moving right or down, which are the margins of these two-dimensional matrix. For the first time, we have a hypothesis from three different possible resources. In this case, we can add one gap to sequence 0, after we add a gap to sequence 1. That would be this arrow. However, we could also do the opposite thing by adding an insertion in the sequence 0 and then adding an insertion to the sequence 1, which would be this arrow. But now there is a third option, and that third option represents the idea of keeping things the way they are. So if we start from the initial position where T matches A, somehow, then we can move diagonally by moving down one position and mapping it to the respective position as we move right in the sequence 0. That way we go down and right one position, making the comparison of G and T. And now we need to look into a different subsection of our parameters, the penalty scores. Because comparing G and T represents an example of a transversion. That is the idea that if two positions are the same at some point in the evolutionary history of these sequences, one G had to turn into a T, which is quite improbable given that the chemical affinity of the pyrimidines and the purines make them prone to turn into each other. So we penalize transversions from one molecule type to another molecule type higher than what we would do if we had an A to a G or a C to a T. So in this case, we have the transversion with a value of minus 3. So going from 0, so, so going from 0 down here would have minus 3 to have the position G and T. However, if we just want to add the insertion, we would need to add negative 2. So that would give us a total of negative 4 if we come from here and negative 4 if we come from here. And now we have three possible scores. The one we keep is the smallest. It's the smallest that represents the best hypothesis that requires the least amount of steps. Now that we have the value of negative 3, we can keep repeating the experiment. This time, the best score is negative 2. To look into why that's the case, consider adding negative 2 to the negative 3 to go right, that gives us minus 5. Negative 2 to negative 2, we compare G with G, which is a perfect match, and therefore gives us the original value that comes from here. Minus 2, minus 0 is minus 2. And then the last hypothesis that involves adding a gap, that also gives us minus 2. Minus 4 minus 2 is minus 6. So from these ones, you can see that the maximum value is again minus 2 and we keep that hypothesis. We keep moving forward, and eventually we can traverse the entire two-dimensional matrix, calculating every single score. Here we have them, and that is the first step of the dynamic programming algorithm, calculating every single possible scenario. Now that we have this, we can traverse the matrix backwards by calculating the path that is most probable given the scores. In other words, we start at the bottom right corner. From here we can ask which of the three different positions are going to yield the lowest score. Here we have from minus 4 to minus 6 horizontally, from minus 4 to minus 2 vertically, and from minus 4 to minus 4, which is diagonal. These ones, remember, horizontal and vertical represents the insertion of gaps. It's just in which of the sequences we're going to add those gaps. 
Whereas the other one, which is the diagonal, is going to represent the idea of keeping the sequences with their current values. So which of these three hypotheses is the most appropriate? Well, it's going to be going from minus 4 to minus 2. And we'll repeat the experiment. Going from minus 2, we can go to minus 4, minus 4, or minus 2. So it seems that keeping the pairing of g versus g as they are right now is the best hypothesis. We repeat the process once, twice, and thrice. Going back to the point of origin and the sequence alignment is done. Here is a more graphical representation where we also add the alignment, the final, the final alignment of the two sequences. You can see here that by moving vertically, we added a gap in the sequence number one by matching the value of a with that underscore. And over here, we added a gap by moving horizontally, which adds a gap to the sequence number zero by matching the value of t against an underscore. It makes sense because it seems that most of the nucleotides have been paired against each other, which is exactly what the purpose of the alignment was. To implement this in Python, however, keep in mind that sometimes it is just easier to traverse a matrix by inverting it first. That means that the position of the numbers in this, in this matrix is going to have to get mirrored vertically, as if we had placed a mirror in front of it, and also it's going to have to get flipped horizontally, as if we have placed the mirror upside down. We're going to end up with something that looks like this. This is mostly for the purposes of the algorithm. It's just easier to go through indexes by adding than subtracting, especially for Python, because Python has the tendency of working with negative numbers as looking at the last elements in an arrange.